Hey y'all, we're gonna have a little talk about racism, Charlottesville, Virginia, Mod Vegan, and the solar eclipse. This is a world. This is a world premiere. This is a world. Hey, I hope everybody's well. Today I thought I would just take it easy and have a conversation with you about some things that have been on my mind. You guys know I just got back from Chicago and was really um, fortunate to find out that I was able to um, uh, do a little bit of a live stream. It was a short live stream yesterday from the Greyhound bus leaving Chicago, heading back to Detroit. The whole trip took about five hours, um, but I don't, I wouldn't say it was brutal, but, uh, um, I wouldn't say it was brutal. So uh, if you are one who is interested in traveling by bus, um, you know, I'm not getting, uh, this is not like a paid solicitation or anything like that, a paid promotion or anything, but you know, I definitely would recommend it because there are so many things that you get to do when you are by yourself and you are traveling by bus. For example, um, it gets to, it stops and you get to get off and stretch your legs from time to time. And um, obviously, if you're not the person who's doing the driving, that means that you know you're free to do other things like do your live stream, even though you're in transit. Uh, certainly not something that I would feel so comfortable doing on an airplane, for example, because you don't have access to your you know internet, so your wireless has to be off. In fact, you have to be in airplane mode, as it's said. But. So today is the day of the solar eclipse, and according to Miles, who's just in the next room, it's the first one since uh, 1998, and um, uh, I don't think I was about as interested in that uh, solar eclipse as I am in the one that's happening now. I know that it's happening. I know that there are people that I, uh, who are friends of mine, who are traveling to places in the world so that they can be along that you know particular path where the view of the eclipse will be the most clear. And I think that's great, but um, I have some other things on my mind right now, so I don't have, I don't have that much time to be um, devoting to um, the eclipse. So that leaves that part away. So a few days ago, or perhaps it was even a week ago now, Mod Vegan, who is you know one of the, the vegan YouTube content creators that I follow, and uh, who I you know, have an awful lot of respect for, uh, have a lot of respect for Margaret, made a video about being on, what it means to be on the right side of history. And obviously this is in, this is connected to what happened uh, last week or over a week ago now um, uh, on the, uh, on I believe it was the 12th of August in Charlottesville, Virginia, when we had this gathering, or actually it was the two days, um, there, were, there was the evening before the Friday evening, where a group of patriots, people who consider themselves patriots, in defense of a particular American ideology showed up in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, Part of that was surely protesting the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue from the campus at uh, University of Virginia, but certainly it had a lot more. Uh, there were a lot. There was a lot more at stake, I believe, for that group than simply whether or not a statue remained. I imagine that many people who were part of that group had no idea that statue was there to begin with. And many of them will likely never find themselves in Charlottesville, North Carolina again. Uh, but something was important enough to bring that group of people to that space to make the statement that, uh, that they made. And the reaction to the events that occurred in Charlottesville have been certainly diverse. <laughs> They've certainly been diverse, yes? But I think the thing that is striking me um, as a little bizarre, feeling a little like I'm in the twilight zone, is a year ago um, I was having these conversations and they felt so theoretical. In fact, I, I I at times had doubts about whether the conversation 
was even important. You know, the conversation was something that was even valid in 2017, 2016. Um, and uh, I've been criticized by a lot of people uh, for making videos that discuss um, oppression, that discuss white supremacy, that discuss racism that might possibly exist in the world today. Um, and now I don't feel that way. <laughs> now I feel like a lot of those things um, clearly were relevant uh, and they clearly were things that needed to be dis needed to be discussed and the lack of discussion certainly did not prevent what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. So what is, where does that leave us? What does that mean? Um, certainly there's been a response from the President of the United States which one would have thought would have been simple, simply that we do not you know condone hatred, racial hatred. We don't condone the actions of the neo-Nazis or the KKK or white supremacist, period, right? And we, um, and we stand against those things. We are willing, you know, people, you know, as a, as a nation, we have historically um, died to suppress the existence of those forces in the world, in other places and here. Um, some could say that the Civil War was fought to secure, you know, the equality of, you know, all human beings as equal. I don't say that that's necessarily the true, but one could, one necessarily true, but one could say that, right? One could say that. So it is not a question of whether or not it is right to fight against the forces of white supremacy. That it is uh, that it is a that it, that it is acceptable in in the United States to take up arms for what is considered a worthy cause. So the question of how uh, fascism, racism, white supremacy are addressed has been settled, at least in the United States. We fight for those things. We fight to, uh, so that those things um, uh, do not take root in this country. And so for the president to say that there was violence on both sides um, denies that historically there has been violence on both sides, but that we have made the decision that it is worth shedding blood to see that uh, all Americans are equal to see that we have certain liberties uh, to protect the rights that are, you know, bestowed or inalienable, uh, but certainly uh, written into our Constitution. So, for the president to talk about violence that might have been present on all sides when what was being discussed was, you know, the emergence of hate in the United States shows a complete lack of understanding on his part uh, regarding what is valuable to Americans and what those Americans are willing to do to uphold those values. What does that mean? Does it mean that the president is racist? <laughs> does it mean that the president is... Uh, a white supremacist, that he supports the actions of those white supremacists, I don't know. But it certainly shows a lack of understanding on the part of the president. Um, and it seems to me that the president could do more reflection in that area, to say the least. Um, unfortunately, we have, a we have a president right now who has not shown the capacity for self-criticism or self-reflection. And that's pretty sad, um, considering the power that that office holds. So I was in Chicago and I got the opportunity to hang out with Julian Bowal, who is the son of the founder of the Theater of the Oppressed, Augusto Bowal, who is um, the late Augusto Bowal. And I, you know, I consider Julian a friend. So most for, for the most part, the trip for me was an opportunity to hang out with Julian. I also have a very good friend. Stephen, who lives in Chicago and has lived in Chicago now for two years. So it was a great opportunity for just for me to see people that I love. However, 
uh, I did participate in the Theater of the Oppressed workshop that uh, Julian was giving. It was an advanced workshop and he was introducing some new techniques, exploring ways that we traditionally look at oppression. And what is interesting is we have often conversations about how, you know, racism isn't about what happens on an interpersonal level. And uh, interestingly, in the way that theater of the oppressed has developed over the years, particularly in the, the United States, there's been a lot of emphasis on the interpersonal. So often in plays that are developed, there is an oppressor and an oppressed character, and we see the oppressed character struggling against that individual. And what Julian proposes is that reinforces the idea that it is the role of the individual to overcome the oppression. And if we understand that oppression as a system, then this is inconsistent. What we know is possible even, right? One person can't overthrow racism, right? One person can confront a racist in their life or someone who uh, embraces racist ideology and takes oppressive action based on that racist ideology. But it is not up to that individual to transform racism into something else. And so Julian has been developing ways to look at things more on a systemic level, but while we're working even on an interpersonal level, but bringing people into understandings about how things operate on a systemic level. Um, and also choosing the places that we choose to engage less on, you know, what's happening to a particular individual and looking at what's happening on, you know, in communities, for example, in a neighborhood, um, in a workplace, right? So where things can be challenged, where there are the mechanisms to challenge those systems of oppression, or at least, the, or, or at least um, to ensure that individuals do not have the opportunity to take these uh, forms of action, these, uh, to, um, to, uh, to carry out these actions, right? So um, I hope that's clear. Um, I ended up working in a group where um, someone's father had been involved in a case someone whose father was a lawyer for the ACLU, who um, worked on a case in the 70s where there were a group of Nazis who were planning a demonstration in a town that happened to be inhabited by many Holocaust survivors, um, which is not unnatural, which is not unusual. We find that, you know, groups, uh, you know, like families settle in certain areas and then others go to those areas because uh, those, you know, social resources, that social capital, it becomes really important if you're moving into a different, you know, into, into, you're moving from one country to another. So we see that there are pockets of people from one place in the world all settling in a particular area. Uh, that's true here. Uh, that's true here in Michigan. We have one of the largest um, uh, Muslim populations in the world um, here in, in Michigan. Uh, I think it might even be the second largest population here in Michigan um, outside of the Arab world. That might be true. You need to check on that. However, there was an area where many Holocaust survivors had settled, so this action taken by this Nazi group was, you know, directly an affront to the people who lived in that community. But the ACLU stepped in and defended the Nazis so that they were able to do their demonstration. And so we were looking at this idea of the contradiction that is present when one does something according to one set of values that may be in contrast to uh, their feelings about a situation, another set of values, right? So that those things, those things do happen. And obviously this related to um, what happened in Charlottesville where the ACLU did defend the, the, the Unite the Rights, um, right to have a permit and to have their, their protests, their demonstrations, which led to everything that followed. But there was obviously no way that the people from the ACLU could have known that. And so then this goes, gets into, um, you know, what it means to 
defend freedom of speech. And recently, even before we had this incident in Charlottesville, there's been a lot of rhetoric uh, on social media talking about this value of free speech. We heard it around Berkeley when Milo Yiannopoulos was going to speak there, and there were protests there, protests that became violent. Um, and, you know, who is, you know, what, you know, we were, there are folks who would say that it's, you know, the left, the regressive left that's the most interested in, you know, uh, in, um, in, limiting speech, right? Limiting speech. And, you know, this may be true. I don't know. Someone would have to, um, someone would have to take, you know, some kind of a survey. However, I think that murder and violence is certainly a way to silence people. And so the violence that we see happening on the right and predominantly on the right, uh, I don't know if you all remember my video, but out of 200 events, violent events that happened in the country that were categorized as terrorist uh, events. Um, and I believe it might've been in the last year, um, more than half of those were perpetrated by um, right-wing extremist groups, right? So that there's clearly a, um, a pattern of attempting to silence people through violence that is uh, present on the right um, possibly in the way that we see people on the left trying to use the state and weaponize the state as a way to silence people who say things that they don't agree with. So I wouldn't say that a uh, lack of respect for freedom of speech is more prevalent on the left, just that the mechanisms, the methods used to silence people are different on the left. And that would be that they tend to want to use the state. Um, again, I would have to, you know, see a study or done on the matter to be able to say that that were true. But um, the pattern seems, it seems to play out in the patterns that I've invested in the places where I've investigated it. So then um, what is often brought up to um, counter arguments about free speech is this idea of hate speech, which seems to be a very vague notion uh, to a lot of people, and certainly is a vague notion to me. What is hate speech? What does that mean? Um, is it speech that has its intent to hurt, to damage, to create, you know, uh, an environment where, um, to, to create a threat? I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm certain that, you know, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to come to your house tomorrow and kill you would be considered hate speech. But, um, you know, I could kill you. Is that considered hate speech? Or I wish you were dead. Is that considered hate, hate speech? I don't know. Um, uh, and probably not. And so then looking at the actions that were taking, taken in Charlottesville or looking at the actions that were taken in 1975 when the ACLU defended the Nazis in their demonstration, if we understand that the Nazis exist, um, or at least as they have come to be recognized, um, would be as a group that is determined to see the, the um, death of the Jews, <laughs> right? To see Jews, the defeat of the Jews, the defeat of an entire people and what that defeat looks like, I'm not sure. But targeting Jews as the enemy and historically, um, the violence that we have seen perpetuated against Jewish people throughout the world um, seems to make it clear that the Nazis are a violent group, a terrorist group, a terrorist organization, right? Or at least as they exist today. Um, they are, they uh, um, likely um, elicit fear in certain segments of the population. And the same thing can be said of the, of the KKK. Yes, that the KKK was formed as a way to um, control the movements of black people through violence, through terror, through acts of terror, since the founding of that organization, which in some ways is surprising because uh, I imagine if it were discovered that there were, say, an ISIS cell um, here in Michigan, 
that steps would be taken to infiltrate it or shut it down or capture those folks, but uh, there, were, there would be actions that were taken. And I'm not saying that actions aren't being taken consistently by the state um, towards, the, you know, to infiltrate and to, um, to stop the KKK, right? It's a terrorist organization. Um, but I guess my question is, do people see it as a terrorist organization? How can an organization like the KKK exist in the United States? Perpetrating the actions that they have perpetrated in the past and continuing operating under the ideology that they operate under today. How can an organization like that not only exist, but be protected under the First Amendment? Would, an, would ICE, if there were an ISIS cell, again, if there were an ISIS cell in the United States, would that, would, would ICE, is ISIS protected under the First Amendment in the United States? And I don't know how people feel about it, but it begins to become complicated. And then at that point, are we defending the First Amendment? Are we, de are we defending freedom of speech? Simply for defending freedom of speech, does it become uh, just what the team, that's what the team is about. Our team defends freedom of speech. And so regardless of who, you know, dies for it or who, um, who has their rights uh, infringed upon as an effect of our defense of the freedom, the protection of the freedom of speech of one group, um, we're going to defend it no matter what. And so I was actually having a conversation with Miles last night talking about, you know, who's, who is harmed when the Nazi party does not get to demonstrate in the streets when we're not dedicating taxpayer dollars by providing them with security, what, by providing them with the police force, by setting up the barricades, by cleaning up after, by closing down the street, right, inconveniencing people so that the Nazi party can, you know, demonstrate. Now, that's not exactly what happened in Charlottesville, and so I don't want to give the impression that uh, what happened in Charlottesville was Nazis and K and Klansmen and Klans members were given the right to uh, take over the street and, um, and use up taxpayer dollars. That's not what happened. A group called Unite the Right showed up and it turned out that that group happened to be a front for the Nazi, the, you know, Nazi party and for the KKK and for white supremacists and white nationalists, right? So that's something that was, um, that could not have been known or likely was not known by uh, the, the state, the, the city, when they allowed that to happen. And I'm sure they certainly didn't think that they were going to show up with guns, right? But the question is, again, as I say, who is harmed when the KKK does not speak? Right? Are those members, is there some, is, are, is the KKK or the members of the KKK, is the KKK somehow defending and protecting the rights of anyone? any rights that are, you know, bestowed by, you know, uh, you know, conferred on us by the constitution by, um, with their speech so that the, you know, by preventing that speech, you know, who, who ends up being harmed or is the only thing that's harmed by preventing the speech of the KKK or the Nazi party, the first amendment itself. And, you know, when, the way I look at it, the first amendment is not a living thing. It's a, you know, some words on a piece of paper, right? That have been revoked throughout history. You know, and if you go back and look at my, you know, video on the past videos that I've done on free speech, free speech has been revoked routinely in the United States, particularly in times of war. All right. So it's not as if it doesn't happen. And so why does it become so important to defend it when it comes to, um, you know, these extremist, these uh, extremist groups, especially uh, extremist groups who have routinely as part of their history or have are associated with with terrorism and so then miles brings up the fact well you know what about the fear that might be evoked by a group like black lives matter what if someone is afraid of women marching down the street and then we have to look at the reality you know uh black lives matter regardless of the fact that there are people who would like to categorize them as a terrorist organization don't have as their mission the erasure of white people. <laughs> they don't have their, uh, 
mission, the eradication of Jewish people throughout the world. That is not their mission, whereas these other organizations do have their mission. This, this um, you know, violence and the revocation of the rights of others. And so there's not a moral equivalency there. So yes, although someone might be made frightened at the idea of black people congregation, congregating in the streets, we, do, we need to defend the right of black people as citizens as, you know, they're not, it's not by, by nature of being African-American, one is not automatically a criminal, one is not automatically a terrorist. Uh, one is not automatically prone to violence. And so um, the fear of those individuals when they're being confronted with Black Lives Matter is irrational. Whereas the fear being experienced by individuals when the KKK walks through the street is not irrational. It's tied to a history of behavior. Um, it's as if the person who punched you in the face yesterday comes back in the room today. There is the expectation that they might do it again, especially if they have voiced that desire and the KKK and the Nazi party continue to voice a desire to see uh, the, um, I wanna say the exaltation, to see the elevation of some groups of people at the expense of other groups of people. So I don't know. I don't know what people think about that. Anyway, that's a lot. So I feel like that might be enough to leave us with today. Definitely, please do check out Mod Vegan's video on being on the right side of history um, because there's some, um, some cool stuff happening in the discussion on that video. I'll include a link to it in the description box below, probably. Um, I'm going to be back this week with more videos on this topic, but looking at specifics, um, specifically uh, the responses of our politicians, the government, to the actions that have happened. We're going to be looking at what's going on in the White House. Uh, I am going to be uh, doing a few more reviews. There's some other um, uh, documentaries that I want to share with you. Um, yeah, so look for all that stuff in the coming week. So for now, that's it for this video. Like it if you like it, share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself. The world is again, I will be done again.